Hey everyone, Matt Cannell, owner of Cannell's Dog Training. Today I'm starting a new video series. This is gonna be a Q&A video series. I'm answering questions asked of me by people on social media, in the comments sections of my videos, by my customers themselves when I go to our lessons, uh, by people I meet, by friends and family. And I think if you listen to these questions, although some of them seem rather specific, a lot of pet dogs are having the same problems as your pet dog. So I want you to listen for the commonalities because a lot of this stuff will apply universally. And although I can't give specific advice for you, I think you'll find some nuggets of wisdom that might be helpful. If you find this content helpful, please like and subscribe. I'm planning to do these video series maybe every week, every two weeks, depending on how quickly questions roll in. Let's get into it. All right, so if you see me looking to the side here, I've got my questions over here, I got my camera over here. I think over time I'll probably find a, a more efficient setup, but this is what I got for now. So first question on the list is a bit of a softball. I put it up first because it's such a common myth. This person asks, can an old dog learn new tricks? Now, this comes from, I think, people having a harder time teaching their older dog stuff. And oftentimes it's true, when I go to train an adult dog or a senior dog even, the training does take longer. But it's not that they can't learn new tricks or learn new skills. Really what it is is that you've just got months or years of ingrained habits and patterns that we have to break before we can start new ones. So a lot of times there are crappy behaviors that override any kind of thinking the dog might be doing. So we have to break those patterns down, make sure the dog doesn't want to engage in those habits anymore, and give them some alternative behaviors. So it can take longer, but it's definitely doable. The other caveat here is, uh, you know, we're assuming that your dog is not demented yet, that they're still all there mentally and within their uh, physical capabilities, right? Some dogs do lose their sight, lose their hearing. That makes things a lot harder, not impossible, but harder, uh, and as well as injuries and illnesses. So if you've got a dog that has a heart condition, for instance, you're not gonna be running agility. If you've got a dog with a bum back leg, you're not gonna have them doing a sit pretty begging kind of pose or anything like that. So be reasonable about what you can expect, but your dog absolutely can learn new tricks. All right, we've got a more serious question second. So this one is, do you think it's okay for a dog to be trained on how to completely ignore dogs? That's the advice my trainer gave. He thinks my dog's reactivity is genetic. So there are a couple of things to unpack here. I'll start with the genetic component. Genetics do matter. And it's certainly true that a dog's personality is relatively set. We can't, in a short period of time, change your dog's personality. It, it is largely what it is um, once they mature, right? If you have a puppy, of course, things are gonna change. Uh, but generally, once they've hit adolescence, your dog is who they're gonna be, uh, except for minor and very gradual changes over the course of their life. Now, we can't affect that personality through training, but that takes a lot of time. Uh, now, for the first part of your question, as far as whether it's acceptable to teach your dog to ignore dogs, I think that's a perfectly reasonable starting point. In fact, that's what I do with my reactivity and aggression clients. We don't train the dog to start by liking their trigger. We teach them to ignore it. We teach them it's none of your damn business, so just settle down. That's the first step. And then once we've got the dog able to just keep their shit together for a while around those triggers, then we can focus on, hey, here's some better things you could do, whether it's walking on by, whether it's holding a stay or place command in the house when we have guests that they don't like, whatever it is, it's about giving the dog a different job than focusing and uh, obsessing about whatever their trigger is. And then through time, we can reinforce those better behavior patterns those better behavior patterns will eventually, many times, lead to a personality change where the dog will say, oh wow, this is actually easier. I don't have to lash out about this thing. It wasn't gonna hurt me anyway. So it's yes is the answer to your question, but keep in mind that that's just the first step. And if your trainer is using genetics as an excuse not to train further, maybe be a little bit wary. Next question is a short question with kind of a long answer. Now the question is, does my dog need an e-collar? 
And my answer is sort of multifaceted. Now, the first thing is I train a lot of dogs on e-collars. The vast majority of my customers are being trained on e-collars for various reasons. And it's a tool that I use frequently. People hire me for my ability and comfort with using an e-collar and teaching them how to use it. With that being said, no, your dog doesn't need an e-collar. No dog needs an e-collar. We started domesticating the wolf as a species roughly 40,000 years ago, depending on who you ask. And for most of that period, there have not been electric remote collars to play with. So there are definitely other tools you can use. There are definitely other ways to train a dog, but you need to keep in mind that the tool doesn't do the training. The human does the training and the dog participates in the training. So it, it's the interaction between you and your dog. The tools just facilitate that. Now, with that being said, why would you have a flip phone in 2021 when smartphones are available? So I basically equate a remote collar to a smartphone, right? It is a high-tech leash or a high-tech training collar. Now, it's actually harder to train with a remote collar than it is without because there's so much more nuance to it. Now, when they were first invented, they were just shock collars. There weren't a lot of settings. They kind of all the settings that existed just all sucked for the dog. And basically it was dog did a crappy behavior. We mark and punish that behavior with a high level correction on the e-collar. And we can still do that. So that's one way to use the e-collar. But there's another way that a lot of people don't realize. And I think the people who are against them aren't aware of this ability or, or don't think that the average person can handle it. But you can nudge a dog's behavior in the right direction and actually reinforce good stuff using a remote collar. This is why I train my off-leash basics package with a remote, because when I have a dog off-leash, this allows me to communicate with them at a distance without having to continue shouting commands at them, right? The command is come, usually, but if I need the dog to make adjustments, I can do that with the e-collar. But it takes longer because we have to layer that onto a command that the dog already knows. You have to train it first. You have to make sure the dog knows how to shut off the pressure. Otherwise, it's just going to be confusing. It's just information. And you need to make sure that you go through the steps of proofing it so that you don't have to press it all the time forever to get the dog to do something. You're not just compelling behaviors. You're actually trying to shape behaviors by giving them feedback and course corrections as they participate in the training. Now, it does matter what e-color you use if you're gonna do that. I use e-color technologies. This is a 300 mini educator. Um, I'm not going to endorse brands. I manage this one, or I mentioned this one just because this is the one I sell. Uh, but you do want a high-end, I won't say expensive, but not cheap e-collar, and it needs to have 100 plus levels. That sounds crazy, 100 levels, but really what that means is that you've got lots of little increments. So you can jump from one to two and it's not a big deal. If you have an e-collar with 10 or 20 levels and you jump from one to two, it's a pretty big jump and you can overwhelm your dog. So make sure you get a quality e-collar if you're gonna do it. Make sure you find a trainer who's familiar with using them. Use the brand that they're comfortable with and learn how to use it both of those ways. And if they're not familiar with both of those ways, find another trainer because there are those two different ways to use it. Next question is, our dog is reactive to dogs. How do we socialize him? So there's a couple things going on here. One is there's different kinds of reactivity. It could be through fear, could be actual aggression, could be even excitement. Reactivity uh, runs kind of a wide uh, spectrum of emotional states. So there's different types of reactivity. But the main thing is you've got explosive uh, reactivity generally implies explosive behavior, kind of really out of control stuff. And uh, it's, in any case, unwanted, unacceptable antisocial behavior. So it's stuff that needs to stop. But the second part of your question, the socialization, you may have the wrong definition of that term. So I want to talk about what that is. Socialization actually refers to a very specific period of a puppy's development. The socialization period is weeks three through 12 of a puppy's life. During that time, during the, the primary half of that time, they need to be exposed to their mother and their litter mates. And during the latter half of that, they need to make sure they get exposure to 
the breeder through hum you know, humans handling the sounds of human voices. And dogs that miss that imprinting in weeks three through 12 or dogs that get bad experiences as part of that imprinting really have a hard time relating to one or both species later in life because they miss that critical period imprinting. Now, you have no control over that. So what you need to focus on is not socialization in the sense of meeting as many dogs as possible. What you need to focus on is coexistence. Your dog doesn't need to be friends with other dogs. Now, that doesn't mean your dog can't have friends, but your dog would be just fine if it never met another dog. All right, dogs are domesticated animals. They don't live in packs anymore. They live with us. So as long as you're meeting your dog's needs, there is no reason your dog has to have another dog friend. In most cases, if I have any kind of dog aggression, I reserve greetings for dogs that are going to have to meet for one reason or another. So my dogs are both dog aggressive. Uh, the only dogs that they meet are friends and family dogs that they spend a lot of time around. My sister-in-law's dog, for instance. And I wouldn't exactly call them friends, but they're friendly acquaintances. Um, now, what you need to focus on first before you even worry about that is coexistence, right? Being able to walk by other dogs on the street without an explosion, without any tension even. Uh, being able to just hang out in a park or outside Starbucks and have your dog be chill. And to do that, you need to find a trainer who is comfortable with stopping unwanted behavior because there's no amount of reinforcement that will make your dog comfortable with other dogs if your dog is engaging in self-reinforcing reactive behavior. You need to stop that behavior first and that can generally be done in one lesson. Leash reactivity to other dogs is the most common thing that I deal with and unless the dog has some other thing going on, whether they're, they're, they've got a problem with me and we have to work through that, there's no reason we can't get the dog out in the first lesson and walk around other dogs without an explosion. It's not always pretty that first time, but we can do it. And then from there, you can start to change the emotional response. But find yourself a trainer near you who's familiar with doing that. Next question up is, when I tell my puppy to sit, she sits, gives paw, lies down, and starts to roll. I can't get her to just sit still. How do I get her to sit still? So uh, what your puppy is doing is called cycling. This is really common behavior. Um, take note of those behaviors in the order that they're in. Those are probably the way that you taught them, right? In order to give paw, your dog has to be sitting. Most people train down from a sit, so they go sit to down. And then of course your dog has to be lying down in order to roll. So your dog is offering all of those behaviors in the order you've trained them. What's happening is your dog is confused and thinks that sit means the entire chain of events. So you need to make sure you're using some form of a marker to let your dog know that the behavior is complete and the reward is incoming. And there are different approaches to marker training. Probably the most common and familiar is a clicker, um, but you can use the word yes, you can use the word good, um, but it's simply your dog, their butt hits the ground, you'd say, you say sit, their butt hits the ground, you go, yes, treat, right? Or their butt hits the ground and you say good, and then you would ask for another behavior. So in my training, I try to differentiate between a continuation marker where I like what the dog's doing, food isn't coming yet, um, but keep doing what you're doing and you will get a reward. Um, and a complete marker, which is like you, you did what you were supposed to and now you're free to come get the food, right? So I use yes for the latter and I use good for the former. Um, that's not super important if you're just starting out, but just make sure that your dog knows that the behavior is complete and that's what they're getting rewarded for. Do a little bit of research on marker training because you will want to charge that mark so your dog knows that behavior's done, go get your food. They should get really excited when they hear that sound, whether it's your voice or a click or whatever. And that will prevent them from going through into the cycle. The other thing is start doing them in random order, right? Stop teaching them or stop demonstrating them to your friends and family in that order because that's showing your dog that that's all it is. It's a series of tricks, right? So your dog should know how to lie down, for instance, without having to be told to sit first. So work on all of those things, but make sure you start with charging a marker and using that marker to indicate that the behavior is complete.
We're getting into slightly more serious territory now. Next question is, how do I stop my dog from barking at the mailman? She sits at the front window and barks every time a delivery person arrives, continues barking after they leave. So you have an unwanted behavior that you need to stop. Now, anytime you want to stop an unwanted behavior, reinforcement by definition cannot help you. Yes, there are alternative behaviors you can teach. Your dog probably should not be allowed to sit at the window and obsess over everything out the front window if their uh, instinct is to bark at things. But you have a dog who, when the opportunity presents itself again, will still bark at stuff. That's a self-reinforcing behavior. You didn't teach your dog to bark. They did that all on their own. They think it's a grand old time. So you need to apply a punishment, which is by definition, just that which stops the behavior. Reinforcement makes more of a behavior, punishment makes less of a behavior. Uh, there are different ways to punish, but when you have a self-reinforcing behavior, we use positive punishment, which means applying something that is unpleasant to the dog as a consequence for the unwanted behavior. I typically will use a remote collar to let the dog know you can't bark, blip. And if the dog barks a second time, I'll go no, blip. Uh, barks a third time, no, higher blip. But we basically just make it uncomfortable to bark. And within two or three repetitions, dogs shut up. They go, oh, I guess that's not worth it. I think I'll stop now. Um, why don't I just go chew on my bone or lay on my bed? Because suddenly they're not getting anything out of the behavior that they previously enjoyed. And in fact, it's now unpleasant for them. So they stop. And if you think about your own life, anything you've stopped doing is something you didn't like very much. Think about a diet or working out or anything you've tried to change, if you stop doing something, it's because you didn't like doing it. Uh, so, or didn't want to be doing it in the first place. So if you want to stop a behavior, you have to use a punishment of some kind. It doesn't have to be an e-collar, but you do need to find a way to correct the dog for that behavior. And then yes, you absolutely should train an alternative behavior. Um, but I think a lot of people don't realize that barking dogs are putting their lives in danger, right? Uh, your neighbors do have a legal ability to shut your dog up one way or another. And people who don't realize that and just wanna let the dog bark it out, either have a lot of space between them and their neighbors and are rather privileged that way, um, or just haven't had very noisy dogs, or they, their neighbors have noisier dogs. But in any case, your neighbors can shut your dog up and it's not good for your dog to continue barking. Plus your dog is working themselves up into a frenzy, right? So if you want your dog to be calmer and feel better, stop that unwanted behavior. Good luck. All right, now we've got a resource guarding question here and I wanna point out that because this is an aggression item that is directed at the owner of the dog, the handler of the dog, this is a dangerous situation and you really should find a trainer local to you that specializes in rehabbing aggression. You should find a trainer that is comfortable with stopping unwanted behavior. They know how to do that. They can apply consequences and show you how to do that. But the main thing you need to know here is resource guarding can be stopped. And I don't just mean managed. Now, the reason I say that is because the question is, my dog resource guards food, toys, and her bed. He used to just growl if I tried to take them, but now growls even if we're walking by. I've talked to numerous trainers. Most of them want to avoid the guarding by managing the dog or trading food for the item the dog has. So first of all, never trade anything to get an item from your dog, especially if they're resource guarding you, right? So if they're guarding an item and you offer them a bribe and they take that bribe and you get to take the treat, you've just reinforced the act of guarding you. Guarding predicts food, predicts you taking the thing. So you've taught the dog to resource guard. And I actually have customers where the dog's not aggressive, but as a puppy, the pup tried that once, the owner was told to trade for food. And as a result, they get a dog six or 12 months old that resource guards stuff. They trained it, it's not really aggressive. So don't do that. The second thing is management can work if it's just one item for instance if your dog's just a little touchy with food and you've got four or five dogs in your house and you don't want them in each other's space i would say management's your solution right put them in crates and feed them in crates feed them in separate rooms whatever you want to do um, but if you've got a dog that's resource guarding multiple objects like this and it's gotten worse over time resource guarding is one of those things that you really don't want popping up at an inopportune moment. So I correct that. I generally do it with a remote collar, although you can do it with any tool that will allow you to 
apply a correction. Um, and a lot of people will tell you that you cannot correct or punish guarding behavior, warning behaviors like snarling and growling. Because the idea is if you correct the growl, then the dog will next time maybe not warn you and go straight to snapping at you. And that sounds logical, but I'll tell you why it's horseshit. Is because the only way that makes sense is if you correct the dog for warning you and then continue harassing your dog for that resource. Most of these things, food, toys, and bed, you have no interest in taking. In fact, you said that you're just walking by most of the time. So if you're not in competition for the item, your dog has no business guarding it. Uh, so I correct the growl and then I leave the dog alone because I'm not telling the dog to leave the item. I'm telling the dog not to aggress towards me because that's not acceptable. So correct for aggressive behavior and leave your dog alone if you can. And for things that you actually have to take, teach your dog an out command and get them to voluntarily release it, then offer rewards for that. That's trained through classic obedience, lots of reinforcement and repetition. Good luck and do get a trainer if you don't already have one. All right, next question is a little more basic obedience. This one says, my dog knows her basic obedience but can be stubborn and will ignore her commands like sit and down. When she's distracted, how do I get her to listen? So first of all, stubbornness is a thing. There are stubborn dogs out there who just don't wanna do stuff because they don't. For some of them, that's a fun game is blowing you off, um, but they're vanishingly rare. In most cases, the stubbornness that I see with my clients is really a command that hasn't been proofed well around distraction, or possibly there was a fundamental flaw in the teaching phase. Um, and it, it's not necessarily anything huge. Uh, it's not a hard fix either. So go back to teaching the command from the ground up. And when you're teaching, let's just go with sit as an example. A lot of people will lure the dog in the sit, which is how I train every dog to do it as long as they're food motivated. And while you're luring, a lot of people will go sit and lure the dog up into a sit and the dog sits and they go good or they click or yes or whatever marker you're using followed by treat. The mistake there is that the lure happened at the same time or before the verbal cue. The verbal cue is sit. And so if your dog is fixated on the food while you're saying the cue, they're not thinking about the word you're trying to teach them. They're thinking about what your hand is doing. So I would make sure that you go sit, lure, good, treat. And as long as you create separation in that process, so you've got steps that your dog can focus on, then your dog will understand the correct cue that you're trying to teach and then you can start proofing it around distraction, and then I think you'll find your dog is much less stubborn. Try that, get back to me. All right, last question here uh, is, my dog is aggressive towards strangers, has bit a few people, and we had a visit from animal control last week. Should I get an e-collar to fix this? Okay, few things. First of all, you have a dangerous dog, so you really should get a trainer to get eyes on your dog and give you hands-on help. I cannot diagnose your dog remotely. I can do virtual consults, but this is a dangerous thing. So even if I did a virtual consult, I would still recommend you get a trainer near you to help get hands on your dog. Um, now dangerous doesn't mean bad, doesn't mean mean, right? You could have a very fearful dog. You could have a very excited dog. I, I don't know, but dangerous just means your dog is acting aggressively and doing harm right? And has the capacity to do more harm. So you got to get help with that. Um, to answer the second part of your question, should I get an e-collar to fix this? You could get a lot of things to fix this. So e-collars are part of my aggression package, but the e-collar doesn't do the training. It's the tool I choose to use to do it, but you really need to have a comprehensive plan that involves stopping an unwanted behavior, creating better alternative behaviors through obedience, and then creating a better mindset through lots and lots of repetition and habit and behavioral change. So again, find a trainer near you and get practicing. So that's it for today's episode. Thanks for watching. If this helped you at all, please like, share, and subscribe. I do want this video series to help as many people as possible. And if you have questions you'd like to ask me, put them in the comments, send me an email, 
You can find me across social media on every platform as Matco Dogman. And I'll do another video like this in a week or two, but I'll also be doing a few videos where I cover more specific topics where I might cover, say, just resource guarding for an entire episode. I'll probably do some basic obedience episodes, maybe some how-to stuff. Uh, let me know if you want to see some of that. Um, but get at me with more questions. I'll answer as many as I can uh, once every week or two. And I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.